Abraham Bolden, and I'm from East St. Louis and proud of it. Well, I grew up in East St. Louis, Illinois. I was born at home, 106 North 11th Street uh, in East St. Louis on January the 19th, 1935. And it's the only appointment that I've kept since then. But anyway, <laughs> when I was growing up in East St. Louis, such a wonderful place. A trying time, the riots had just occurred in East St. Louis. In 1927 up to 1930, there had some terrible riots there. So that was a lot of racial tension. But growing up there, we didn't notice it, but we did notice things like that were separate high schools. We had East Side High School and we had Lincoln High School. And they were getting a much better education at the other high school. But what concerned me more than anything else was how we treated one another. I was very sensitive to that, and I always wondered why. You know, we lived about two blocks from St. Mary's Hospital. And I used to lie in bed on Saturday night, and I would hear the ambulance as it would roll by the house, carrying somebody who had been cut out of staff. And I wanted to make it an objective in my life to do something about that. I was at a young age, less than 12 years old. A heart-wrenching experience that I experienced one day when I saw one brother kill another brother. Little Ed was killed by Big John over a checker game. Big John accused Little Ed of cheating. Little Ed pulled out a knife, slashed Big John. Big John pulled out a gun and shot Little Ed six times. And that scene followed me because after I became so literate where I could read the Bible, it reminded me of the time that Moses saw a Hebrew fighting an Egyptian. It made such an impression on him, it changed his whole life. It woke him up. And this incident between Big John Lillette changed my life. So I set out. And fortunately, I grew up at a time where teachers were teachers. They were like family. And they treated you like family, so to speak. They were very interested in your progress and how they loved and how warm that they were. They came by your house. Sometime you would walk in the house and you would see a teacher sitting there having a chicken leg with your parent. And I remember Mr. Beefmore, I remember Mr. Gladden, as I said, Mr. Wooden, yeah, we felt right at home. Mr. Buchanan, band director. He was a teacher and mentor to the children who were in the band. That's where I met Miles Davis. He was in a band. And he became a great man. And he became a, an icon in the music world. And we have such outstanding people like Wilma Rudolph, and we also had Jackie John. We also had Henry Nicholson. I don't know if you remember Reverend Henry Nicholson. He became a major preacher in East St. Louis. These were friends of mine. Now, my father was a great man. I worshiped my father. I looked up to him. He held two eight-hour jobs for a packing company and the Louisville Railroad. He was a stockman at Louisville. He was a hard worker. 
and he was a hard man. When I say hard, I meant there was only one man in the house, and that was him. He gave an order, you either obeyed the order, you found somewhere else to stay. I know I used to threaten to run away a lot of times. I'm going to run away from it. I'm going to run off. They weren't surprised because they knew my thoughts about things like that. I seemed to have that East St. Louis spirit of being close and loving everybody. That was the spirit of East St. Louis, especially the Lincoln High School at that time. When we went to school, we felt like we were going home. Bolins were a great musical family. At the age of nine years old, you had to take piano lessons whether you wanted to or not. Because my father and mother taught us that taking piano lessons taught you discipline. And I'm just proud to be from District 189. Because, as I said, it was an exercise of real love really caring for each other. We had a spirit of family. Now, contrary to that, I didn't see any of that when we moved to Chicago. Chicago to me was the coldest place in the world. October 30th of 1960, to be sworn in with the Secret Service. I thought Chicago was the worst city. And I still think that even though I've been here since 1960, it was cold. You know, the one thing that I noticed right away when I came to Chicago, in East St. Louis, people would be going to work early in the morning. East St. Louis had a wonderful bus system. Men had the lunch buckets and everything. When the bus would stop, the men would step back. The women got on the bus. The men got on last and had a seat. Here in Chicago, I was at 63rd and Cottage Grove. Pulled up. It was so many people were standing on the platform, I, I got scared. I mean, Chicago was just so big and out of order. So far as I was concerned, when that air train pulled up and the doors opened, the men started pushing the women down and, and airborne them and everything. I said, these are heathens up here. I mean, I'm in heathensville around here. Let me go back. Before I came to Chicago, I had a job. After I, in 1956, I graduated from Lincoln University, cum laude, third in a class of 95. I had a job waiting for me in Mayfield, Kentucky, teaching band. My wife was looking in the newspaper and she said, Abraham, she says, you know, I know that You've been talking about going in to police work, she said, Pinkerton. So I, she clipped the little advertisement, I helped on the advertisement out of the paper. And I walked into the little office and the little secretary was sitting there. So she looks up at me, and she was a young European lady. She looked up at me and said, yes. I said, I'm here to apply for the job. She says, we don't have a job over. And I say, yes, you do. So I reached in my lapel pocket and I showed her the paper that my wife had given me. And she said, we're not hiring people like you. Mr. Mertz, who was the district director, he happened to be surveying the St. Louis office and he heard the conversation. So Mr. Merch walked out of the office and said, uh, what's the problem out here? 
Secretary Tom said, well, he wanted to file the application, but I told him we didn't have anything open. He said, yes, we do give him an application. Fill out the application. As soon as you fill it out, send him in to see me. I went in and talked to Mr. Mertz. Mr. Mertz said, you're going to be the first Negro private detective that Pinkerton ever hired. And he gave me that start into police work that I'd been looking for all my life. Now, I worked for Pinkerton, they trained me. They, Pinkerton trained very good. Handwriting, photography, and different things like that. They sent me to internal school for, I stayed there for about four months. After I was with Pinkerton for a year, the wife happened to be reading the paper again. <laughs> she says, Abraham, the state police are hiring troopers. And uh, I said, uh, no, I like the job I'm on. She said, no, you should apply. I said, why? She said, it's going to be more than just you and I. And I don't think we can make it on what you're making now. So I went to Springfield and applied for the Illinois State Police, became a trooper in 1957. And they transferred me to Peoria, Illinois, where I was the first black trooper ever in District 8 in Peoria, Illinois. They used to call me Smokey when I was in Peoria, Illinois. There was a young man from Massachusetts who was running for president. He was coming to P.O. Illinois on a campaign address. Oh, here I am, a state policeman now. He came through P.O. to speak at the P.O. courthouse on Main Street near Superior Avenue in Chicago. I mean, in a P.O. And this young man was John F. Kennedy. Me and when the plane landed and the convoy came in, I was standing right outside of Pierre Airport to stop the traffic so the convoy could make a turn. But I knew that this young man who I had seen on television so many times talking about what he was going to do for everybody, not just black people. And he impressed me so much that he was talking from his heart. This wasn't just politics. This was a man who believed what he was saying. Secret Service agent happened to be in Peoria, Illinois, and they assigned me because I was one of the most intelligent troopers that they had. If you had an outstanding job, you looked uh, on pretty high. State police was really a high class job back then in the 50s. And so now when the special agent in charge, Fred Baxter was his name, he came to Peoria, you know, he was working on some counterfeit case, check case, and we had a conversation. I said, Mr. Baxter, do they have any Negro Secret Service agents? Mr. Baxter told me, I don't know, but why don't you make an application? I said, yes, sir. So I went to Springfield, made out an application, was accepted into the Secret Service, and was to report for duty on October 30th in Chicago, Illinois. October 30th of 1960. So I moved my wife to Chicago. She was very happy. She was very happy. She had been wanting to get to Chicago all her life. And like I said, this city here has been hell for me from the first day on. But she loved Chicago. So now the Secret Service was very prejudiced. They would tell off-color jokes around me. 
until they found out that I didn't play that stuff. I heard my supervisor say, you know, I don't want to embarrass anybody in here, but I know this joke about this Negro. He was down in me. I said, wait a minute, sir, just a minute. You just said you didn't want to embarrass anybody. So why would you continue to tell a joke that might embarrass me? If you held up for yourself, they call you thin skin, you know. And in the meantime, the whole country was going through some of the worst civil rights strife that the world has ever known. Black people were being lynched. Now, Kennedy was coming to Chicago to thank Mayor Daley for getting out the vote and putting him over as president of the United States. The Secret Service Office had the authority to assign a protection for President Kennedy. Now, the president brings his own detail, but wherever city he goes in, they have to also pitch in and help protect the president. When it came to my assignment, they moved the Chicago police from in front of a washroom in McCormick Place and put me there. It was very difficult for me to stop rich white folk from using the washroom. And I'm standing there in plain clothes. I'm a black man and I'm telling people who had donated thousands of dollars to the Kennedy campaign that they couldn't use that washroom. But that's what the Secret Service did. They put the Chicago policeman in my position upstairs near the president. So here I am standing in front of the washroom, twirling my thumbs, and at 8.30 p.m., April 28th, 1961, I heard the motorcade come up and stop in front of McCormick Place. When the motorcade stopped, the first thing the president wanted to do was use the washroom, and there I stood. The president came down the steps with every Democratic dignitary within miles of Chicago, Adlai Stevenson and, and George Don, Congressman Dalton, everybody was with the president. There was anybody that was a Democrat. So I kind of stepped to the side. The president stepped to the side too. And he looked me in the eye and he smiled. He said, are you a Secret Service agent or are you one of Mary Daly's finest? I said, I'm a Secret Service agent, Mr. President. The president asked me after he found out my name was Bowling. He called me Mr. Bowling. From then on, Bowling said, has there ever been a Secret Service agent assigned to the White House detail? I said, not to my knowledge, Mr. President. President Kennedy asked me, he said, would you like to be the first? I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. He said, I'll be looking forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. Now, you can't beat that with a stick. And we had that conversation that brought all of this about history. I'm down in history now. I mean, United States history. Not just East St. Louis history. World history. The Secret Service didn't like it either. Because on June the 6th of 1961, I flew to Washington, D.C. under the orders of the President of the United States of America, John F. Kennedy, and I made that long walk to those White House doors. Grabbed one of the doors, pulled it open, and walked into history. Walked into this. But you know, my supervisor, Harvey Henderson, 
he didn't like he didn't like black folk. He was from Mississippi. So we're in Massachusetts at the Kennedy compound. Let me tell you the type of man Kennedy was. Kennedy's own everything there in Hannesport that I could see with the naked eye, except the ocean. They own all the beaches and all up and down there. The kids were playing pick up football, and they young kids, you know. Kennedy called them all together, called me. I went over there, he told the kids, he said, you're gonna see Mr. Bolt walking back and forth. He is a U.S. Secret Service agent. This is Mr. Bolt. If you address him, this is Mr. Bolt. See, he, he told him. He didn't want no stuff. He put me on what they call a follow-up boat. Now this follow-up boat is something. This follow-up boat's got two Thunderbird engines in there. The thing be going about 40, 50 miles out. It gets way ahead of the yacht, got a big siren on it that almost deaf you when, when you hear. And it's telling all the other boats out there in the Atlantic, stay back. It's the president's yacht. Well, they put me on the yacht. I, I mean, on the, on the follow boat. Twice, two days in a row. That's a hell of a sign. And I would see those agents <laughs> Periodically, they would move from one side of the boat to another because they knew the routine. I didn't know the routine. So here, I'm holding on for dear life, holding on to the rail on the side of the boat because nobody knew that I couldn't swim. But I never told anybody I couldn't swim. Here I am with the bread, and I'm just thinking, you know, how it would look. if. On the headline, it said, President Saves Secret Service Agent from Drowning. I'm getting ready to go on a follow up boat on July the 3rd, 1961. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. The President comes out on the deck of the yacht. He calls my supervisor over there. The supervisor comes to me. All mad. This, this guy was so mad he could have drank a bowl of razor blade. And so Harvey Henderson had resisted. He said, Well, Mrs. President, Bowl was assigned to the follow up boat. President said, Change your sign. That's what simple as that, change your sign. So here I am, I'm sitting on the yacht. That's good enough for me. On the back of the yacht, we cruising along, you know, I'm enjoying myself. And all of a sudden, this sailor comes out dressed in white. And he's carrying this pla platter with him. The sailor reached down, and he pressed some kind of button, and whoops, came up a tray light. Came up right in front of me. He set the tray that he was carrying on top of that and said, the president would like for you to have lunch. Lord have mercy. President John F. Kennedy would like for you to have lunch. Clam chowder soup or Coca-Cola. I'm telling you, I was in heaven. I said, I couldn't believe it. Here the president of the United States sending me lunch. But when we got back to the little compartment where we were living, my supervisor had just seen me and Bobby Kennedy and the president talking together. The president called me over and said, have you met my brother Bobby? And we had a short conversation. Bobby Kennedy wanted to know. Why didn't you come here to the FBI? We're always looking for 
Menard. He said, do you plan to make a career out of the Secret Service? I said, no, I, no, Mr. President. I said, I would like to become a diplomat to one of African countries. The president says, well, I'll be around for a few more years. He said, you learn to speak an African dialect, any language. I'll see that you meet your goal. Now, he had already promised me to make me the first African-American Secret Service. So I had every belief that he would follow through if he got reelected again. I would have been a diplomat to Africa. My southern supervisor, he's standing there looking at us, had this conversation. Whoa, we talked about Dr. Martin Luther King and some other things that I can't go into right now. He's standing back. So when we get back to the hotel, he's sitting there drinking his beer. He said, Bowling. I said, What heart? He said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't you ever forget it. And he slid to the end of the couch that he was sitting on to make sure that he emphasized it when he told me. He said, You a nigger. You were born a nigger, you're going to die a nigger, and you'll never be anything else but a nigger, so act like one. That's what, he wanted me to exchange shots with him. That's what he wanted. That was a bait. I looked at him and I said, I love you too, Harvey. And I fight that. <laughs> I was smart. But they had something else for me. Before I got back to Chicago. I went to Washington, D.C., and it was on July the 5th of 1961. I went straight to the chief of the Secret Service office, and I complained. I said, the president's life is in danger. He said, why? I said, because the Secret Service they drink too much. They don't care about the job. They hate President Kennedy. If anything happened, they're not going to react. Chief Yui Bauman said, that's a serious charge. That was my major complaint was that Kennedy needed better protection or he would be assassinated. But you know what they did? They set me up. They got two counterfeiters that I had arrested and had these two counterfeiters to say that I used one of them to try to solicit a bribe from the other one. They came to me and said, Bolin, we need you back in Chicago. We just got a counterfeiting plant, solved a counterfeiting plant. We need you to go on the call. And I knew better than that. But anyway, they checked me out of the Willard Hotel. That's where I was living. Took me to Dulles Airport. Got on the American airline, they flew me back to Chicago. Wouldn't let me talk to anybody. First thing I knew that anything's up, I'm sitting in the office, the U.S. Attorney's Office. Ed Hanrahan walks in with my supervisor. My supervisor, Martin, says, we're going to charge you with soliciting a bribe. I said, that's ridiculous. On May the 21st. They took a case before the grand jury. They indicted me, May the 21st, 1964. I went to trial July the 6th, so in 1964. After the testimony was in, the judge called a jury out from deliberation. Get this now. Call a jury out, all 12 of the jurors and said, in my opinion, the evidence supports a verdict of guilt. And I'm suing the government soon for $30 million for 
for breach of my, not only my human rights, civil rights, because after the judge did that, we asked for another judge. No. He heard a second trial. The second trial, during the deliberation of the jury, he put me and my attorney out of the courtroom. He put everybody out of the building except him, the U.S. Attorney's Office, his Henry Hand. He put everybody clean the building out except government employee, and the jury found me guilty. The judge sentenced me to six years in penitentiary. So now they start me out of Terry Hutt. I, now I know what these people want to do because I have read on what some other people who had been in my position and so-called squealed from the inside. They tried to declare him insane. That's what the government did. And so I prepared for that. When they sent me to Terre Hood, I knew that they were going to work me either into St. Elizabeth or Springfield, one of the two. Those were where the government sent dissidents and had them declared insane. So he sent me to Terry Hutt first, and they transferred me to Fort Leavenworth, which is a, the top prison in the United States. And I also got, had a code worked out with my wife. I said, honey, I'll write you a letter. And any I in that letter is dotted with a circle. Don't believe anything the letter says. You get your butt down there and see what's going on. July the 6th, 1967, I was in Springfield. Three o'clock in the morning, two guards came to my bunk. They tapped me on the bottom of the feet and said, come on, go with us. Now, when you're in a penitentiary like that, you don't have any choice. So we come up to this big steel door, and I could hear the muffled screams coming from the other side of that door. They walked me in there, made me strip of all of my clothes, stripped down, looked all up my butt. I feared for my life. I didn't know if I was going to be able to go through it. They kept me in there, guys, for individual rooms with a little window. That's all you had was a little window to see out. If you look out in the hallway, they had it all set up. On August the 3rd, now this was July the 6th, August the 3rd, one of my spies who were working in the prison, an officer, there was Officer Sweet, said they got you scheduled to go before the review board. They want to change your status. The only person who could assign change my status was the chief of classification at parole. His name was Stevens Nicholson. He hated me. He told me, and he was a brother too, he's a black man. You couldn't tell it, but I mean, he, he was mixed. He was chief of classification after all. He is the only person who can sign a change a classification in the institution as chief of the world, because he works directly out of Washington, D.C. So Washington, D.C. has said, sign the papers to change this man's classification from inmate to psychiatric hospital. 
Once that they did that, then your time stops. You're no longer doing time. You're there for mental treatment. They would have to declare me sane enough to finish my time. They're sane enough now to finish your time. Not to be relieved. This is what the government did to me. I didn't know I was just as before. I, I thought, really, I could really be going and say, supposed to go before the committee. August the 3rd, 9 a.m., I was supposed to be the first one. I had the vision on Wednesday, Thursday, August the 2nd. Stephen Nicholson shot his wife in the leg, chased her down the street, shot up in another guard's house, ran back home, threw a rope across the pipes, his furnace pipes in the basement, put the other end around his neck, stood on an orange crate, jumped off and committed suicide. And he the one who wanted to sign the papers for me being crazy, we're still in slavery. We were worse than slavery because the slave was trying to get free. We think that we are free. But we're worse off than the slave because we don't want to be. We're asking for civil rights and don't have human rights. We begging for what people die for. And that's to be treated like a human being. We have to change, stop marching, and start thinking. We we'll have to think our way out. I didn't say kill nobody, because everybody here is already dead. I'm not for war. I'm for thinking because I feel like this. God made everybody. There's a place, a purpose for everybody a time and a purpose for everything under the heaven. I think East St. Louis, and I see it, is going to be one of the major cities of civilization, of a newborn civilization. Because East St. Louis now is seen like the Bane. It's just like Gary, Indiana. Sweet water, clear water, good water, always drains low. It's going to drain. There ain't no good water on the mountain top. This is melt. But the sweet, good water going low. And we have the talent. We have the inspiration that's going to come from the south, from cities like East St. Louis. Mayfield, Kentucky, Shrookalock, Mississippi. Those small towns like that is where the truth will flourish. They're going to save the whole world. Now, this book, as it says on the back, it is an analysis of the problems of alleged inferiority of the black man in America. And it's by a former United States Secret Service agent and New Age author Abraham W. Bowden Sr. Now this book, if people read this book, we can bring a unity that the world has never seen because we're special people gathered here together. And if you read this book and come to an understanding of this, this is the answer here. We can march until our feet wear down to the bone, but you're going to have to come here. And I've had confidence in that. I have confidence. This book, it doesn't talk about the Bible. It talks about the mind, the logic, wisdom of the mind. And I don't care if you're Christian, Jew, or whatever you are. This is the truth that God wants the people to know. Please.
get this book, and if anybody wants the book, you can't afford it, just write. And I'll buy a copy. Because this is the answer here. No question. Thank you. So, y'all, I appreciate you coming here and wasting your film on me. I hope I said something that's going to inspire somebody someday. And I'm just glad to be able to contribute. I, people say, well, they messed up your life. No, didn't nobody mess up my life. This was my life. This is my life. Suffering was my life. Huh? Because God says in Isaiah, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee out of the furnace of affliction. Huh? That's where you get chosen from. You don't buy a dress without trying it on, would you? See if it's fit. Because if you look at my writings on Facebook and the books that I've done, you'll see you will see the evidence of a living God. I'm not talking about the God that's coming. I'm talking about that's here now, doing his work. And the wise shall prevail. There's no question about it.